maintenance of, of the area. Uh, the Transit Coalition works with Metropolitan Transportation Authority. The, we'll talk about the Cal State Northridge Transportation Tiger Team that's looking at bus rail connections at the Selmar Metrolink stations. So we're working on a lot of projects to better the experience of the transit users. So without further ado, I'll introduce our okay. Mark. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to the NGA. I tell you, after we bought the station last year, we had a reception. A certain group had a reception over in the patio by tracks, and so uh, which is a lovely area. I think it's one of the prettiest stations in the country. And um, so I had a chance to tell the story. It's a true story. Um, uh, when I was a bus operator, I used to work line, it's now line 40, then line 5, and would terminate at the station. So I would walk into the station to use the restroom. And I was a young kid going to college at the time. I'd walk to the building, and I would say, wow, it's beautiful here. It's a beautiful building, but there's no one here. Uh, I would be, I mean, there might be one ticket seller, and me, and that whole building. I would walk through there, and I was just, I was thinking, it's so beautiful, what's going on? Why are they going to tear it down or whatever? So I told that story, and then I said, so how cool is it, how cool is it that 40 years later I get to say, as the CEO of MTA, welcome to MTA's Union Station. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so uh, right now, as a year ago, the revenue stream, the current revenue stream, covers about 90% of the cost for purchase. Included in the, in the purchase are 7 million square feet of development entitlements that MTA owns. Uh, in, in addition to that, revenue is climbing. We have, as you know, lately uh, Starbucks has come in, uh, uh, New was gone, Tracks is going to take over that location and put in uh, kind of a pizza place, uh, brew pub. They, uh, um, some of the guys want to sell food on the east end of the, of the, of the station. Um, tracks may open up the Harveys. Can you guys look in the window at the Harveys? Mm -hmm. yeah, if you haven't, yeah, it's beautiful, it's spectacular. They want to open that up as a late night spot as, as the downtown continues to change. And we are just now uh, shortlisting six firms to work on a site plan uh, for, for this facility. Uh, in that, by the way, I'm asking them to preserve the ability to double train service. Uh, in the future, but I want to build buildings to reach a uh, better train service uh, in the future. Uh, and that includes high-speed rail. Uh, I'll come in on high-speed rail just briefly. Let me, before, before I go off on Union Station, uh, we want to integrate it with, uh, with uh, the Pueblo, with Chinatown, uh, with Little Tokyo, we're adjacent to downtown. It's a great location. What I'm most pleased about with the board uh, is that they understand the historic, iconic nature of the station. And so whatever we do will be respectful of the current beautiful facility which exists. Uh, some of the buildings back where Amtrak is are not historic, so we may move those. But the, the, the ticket office and the waiting room will be maintained. So back to high-speed rail for a minute. Uh, the previous executive director, Roloff Van Ark, has gone the way of Tyrannosaurus Rex. Uh, and this is a blessing for all. Um, he, uh, astonishing individual. Uh, he, I think you could say he failed, failed completely to develop any kind of a plan, a plausible plan that seemed realistic, a vision that a person could imagine might really happen. In fact, High-speed rail authority. Oh, okay. In fact, building a $5 billion so-called test track in the Central Valley, and then the, the plan was this. We build a $5 billion test track with no cars and no connections and no utility. And then we say, oh, we have a $5 billion white elephant, and it will stay a $5 billion white elephant unless you give us $15 more billion. Now, my mother was from Kentucky, and she called that a pig in a boat. <laughs> so now there's a new chair of the board, uh, uh, Dan Richard. That there will be a new set of controversies emerging. But now what we're seeking to do is to get a more 
phased approach which establishes connectivity between Los Angeles uh, and the Bay Area. Uh, we'll still have the high speed track in the middle of the state, that's fine. But we have to achieve connectivity to the Bay Area and to Southern California. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. We also have to introduce some realistic assumptions into the plan. The high speed authority was assuming something like 15,000 parking places at a union station. Holy smokes, we spend billions of dollars bringing services into the station, and these Nimrods want to build 15,000 parking places. They were going to build 12,000 parking places at Silmar. What would the, where would the rattlesnakes go if they did that? You know? Uh, so what they need to do is to inject some reality into their plans. Five-minute headway from LA to San Francisco is with a thousand-foot-long train every five minutes is just not realistic. So anyway, I hope that that we'll succeed to get something moving. I hope there'll be a, a, a project which uh, it will not be pure high speed. So instead of being, but instead of being 16 hours from from Orange to the Bay Area, maybe it's six hours or something like that. Maybe five hours. It's not three, but at least then you establish the platform for investments uh, on a multi-decade basis, kind of like the interstate highway system. So stay tuned uh, with that. We uh, at MTA will insist on a couple of things. One is that, that the line has to come into somewhere down in the station, connect with all of our services, and with Metro Lincoln Amtrak. <coughs> we want to stop at, uh, at Burbank Airport, which the high speed authority didn't want to do. So you, know, it's, you can tell from my frustration here. When you, when you say to somebody, you need to stop at Burbank Airport and the Union Station, and they don't understand why that would be a good thing, that's a difficult conversation to have. Um, we're going to open up the Expo Library line uh, in late April. Uh, as of last week, we began to do uh, full-on pre-revenue testing. Pre-revenue is the shakedown crews. Uh, there are still some bugs out there, as there are on, on all rail projects at, at this stage, uh, but we're looking forward to it. By the way, it's a beautiful line. The elevated stations out of Los Angeles are just, just gorgeous. Um, not so much for the station, but for the place. And when you're there, it's elevated, and you can look south and see uh, Baldwin Hills. You can look to the north and see the Santa Monica Mountains, the Transverse Range, uh, Beverly Hills. You can see where the towers of Bullshit Boulevard are, tracking where the subway will be someday. Uh, you can see the Hollywood sign uh, and the observatory, and you can see Daphne LA off in the distance. It's really a, a beautiful spot. It's a nice line. We're going to have good service. I believe that when it gets to Santa Monica, it'll carry. Uh, 65, 75,000 people a day. It's going to be a great success. Uh, gain, there's going to be two operational challenges on the line which are going to be really tough. One is a Metro Center. If we're running a six minute headway on both lines, the Blue and the Expo, we need a train to go into, this, into the Metro Center every three minutes and, and then it has to depart every three minutes, right? Because you're running two lines on a six minute headway. That's going to be real tough, so we're going to have personnel there and facilities to make sure that we can do it. The operation at USC on exposition will be difficult uh, on game day. Uh, I don't know if I've told you guys this, but I have, I have noted to some that uh, MTA is revolutionizing Los Angeles. You can do things today that were inconceivable 20 years ago. You can take a train uh, to Pasadena, and you can have lunch on Colorado Boulevard. And then you could go, let's say, to the Rose Bowl, and let's say, watch SCB UCLA. <laughs> and, you know, in the future, you can take a train out to Exposition Park. You can see Allosaurus. You can see a mummy. You can go in the Coliseum, and you can see SCB UCLA. It's an all-purpose transit system. Now, if you've been to an SC game, you know 30,000 people, most of whom have been having wine, cross the tracks from the campus to, to the park, uh, along with the band. Uh, so this is going to be uh, a, a challenging operation. We'll have folks out there controlling the crowds. It's going to be it really is going to be good. I've issued strict instructions that we're going to be safe there at that location, but I don't want to have anybody, any SC fan hit. Now, if there's a guy with a blue shirt on, you know, you know things happen. <laughs> um, let me see. Um, let me talk about Frank Alejandro a little bit. He has uh, been the chief operating officer for a couple of weeks. Uh, he uh, was an operator here, bus operator here back when. He was involved very early on 
uh, in, the, uh, in the startup of the rail lines. Um, should I tell them the story about your daily data transfers? You better not. <laughs> <laughs> we used to have daily data transfers. Oh, and Frank was responsible for ordering them. And uh, one day he forgot. So we're carrying two million people a day, but we don't have any transfers. <laughs> Frank. <laughs> so it took a couple Wait till I get up there. <laughs> Wait, Frank, you are on permanent double secret probation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Never mind. <laughs> what, I, what I really expect from Frank, and the reason why he's in the job, is he will bring uh, a traditional level of intensity to the job. A transit operations is not easy. But to be properly managed and operated, you have to keep a schedule, for example. If the timetable says 719, it means 719, not 717. Uh, the buses and the trains are supposed to be clean. They're supposed to be properly maintained. Uh, the stations, not only the, the red line stations are cleaner, we're working on the blue and the green. Uh, I think, I think our, <coughs> frankly, I think our, our inattention to the blue and the green is uh, inexcusable. We're going to go get those stations cleaned up, the green state, reinstall the lighting, Get the, get the uh, landscaping the proper state of affairs. So that's going to require a lot of time and attention and the development of a management team which is committed to building a proper transit system with proper service to customers. That's a big task for Frank. We, we've done a great deal of damage to the, to the traditional cultural values of the, of the, of the operation. So that's going to be uh, more than a notion. You may remember, I'm, I'm sure I told you, when I arrived three years ago, we were running 60% on time, 15, 20% ahead of schedule. That's a terrible state of affairs. We are today, uh, I'm not happy with where we are. We're about 78% on time, which is probably good, but we still have about 1 or 2% running hot. Uh, running hot ahead of schedule is a cardinal crime, should never be tolerated. Uh, but we're making progress. Um, we have, we, but we still have a great deal of work to do. I will say that we've had uh, a terrible couple of months on the blue line. Um, we've had a bunch of service disruptions for a variety of reasons, most of which revolve around deferred maintenance uh, on the rolling stock, uh, on the, the, the systems, uh, the track and the signal and the power distribution system. We've begun to make investments to repair that. I, I've asked my coworkers how long that went on. It may have been 10 years, I don't know, maybe a little longer. Uh, but take our take the cars, the blue line cars should have been rebuilt somewhere around 2004, 2003, 2005, maybe six. It's 2012, and we just did a, a, a minor rebuild on, on the first car. So, you know, if I were, what I want to do is to rebuild all the cars in the midline and run them 40 years, not 30. Right? And so, not maintaining, not not making proper investment in the blue line cars will, will make it difficult to get to 40. They'll get to 30. But it also reflects on poor quality service for the customer, and ultimately less reliable service or sometimes dangerous service. So there's a bunch of little things that you see that we've got to get focused on, the escalators, elevators, cleanliness, um, things of that nature. I am uh, uh, pleased to report on the highway side that work on the I-5 is where we just bought a bunch of property down there on the south I-5. We'll have, you know, that'll be underway by the end of the calendar year. Uh, I've asked our, trans our, our highway guys to work with Caltrans on the freeways. Have I told you, man, when you drive into LA, it looks like the Bronx. <laughs> when you see graffiti and, and vandalism and trash, uh, that if you want to, this is Los Angeles. This is a great place. I remember when the Santa Monica Freeway looked and felt like a freeway in a world-class city. The landscaping was maintained, it was clean. Uh, that's the way it should be. So we're working with Caltrans to get them exercised about this. This is, this is a pathetic small achievement, but um, it took me a year for them to finally do something. You know what it is? Over off the Pasadena Freeway, they just planted some bougainvillea. 
so that when the children go there to apply their art work, they will be confined with long, sharp thorns. <laughs> you know, um, I want to plant bougainvillea and poison and ivy. <laughs> you know, we, we have to confront, if we allow the place, L.A., to look like a dump, it will be a dump. You know, we cannot allow that to happen. So we will push Caltrans to do proper investment, proper maintenance of, of rights of way landscaping. That's a requirement, right? We live here. Um, one more issue I'll comment on before turning over to Frank. We've been working on the Low Sand Corridor initiative for uh, God, about five years when I was in Orange County. The little captain was still in uh, Sacramento. Um, there are three rail. Low Sand describes LA San Diego. It's the Amtrak service from San Diego to San Luis Obispo. Uh, there's other Amtrak service that goes further north, but I'm not talking about that. The state pays for the service south of San Luis Obispo, the surfline service. We pay for the service on the Metrolink, we and the customers. What that means is the same people are paying for Amtrak and for Metrolink, and yet they view each other as competitors. Now, the importance of those two services to me is that during the peak period, they relieve about, north of Fullerton, uh, about one and a half lanes worth of passengers, cars, off the I-5. It relieves the I-5 north of downtown, it relieves the Hollywood Freeway. So what I want is more synergy, more coordination between Amtrak and Metrolink so that we can get more relief on the freeways. It makes a great deal of sense. If, any, if you've driven to San Diego, it's a nightmare. You know, we are sitting on the second biggest corridor in the country, right after the Northeast. And I think that with a low level, with a, with a prudent investment, it is a low level risk. San Diego to Los Angeles, maybe up to Ventura, can be the busiest corridor in the nation uh, because it hooks up so many great things. Uh, and the I-5 is constrained. So we, why do I bring this up? It's taken a long, long time. When I was in Orange, we did focus groups. This won't surprise you. Customers don't care what logo is on a train. They don't care what logo is on a bus. They just want to get where they're going. Uh, when there's a break in the Amtrak service for some reason, much like ought to pick up the Amtrak passengers, right? When the Amtrak has a delay, Amtrak ought to pick them up. That's how it ought to work. Uh, and yet they see each other as competitors. Um, my sound bite is at Union Station. You could pull an MTA bus up if you got it inside the building and put the front door by the Amtrak <coughs> ticket office. You could board that bus with the engine off, by the way, and the brake set, and you could walk to the rear door of the bus and get off, and you'd be at the Metrolink ticket office for a convenient transfer. Why would we have two ticket offices 40 feet apart? <laughs> Why would they not coordinate? So the Lowson Initiative is to create a joint powers authority between San Diego, Orange County, LA, Ventura, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo for the purposes of taking decision authority for that corridor out of Washington and out of Sacramento and bring it down here to Southern California. My longer range goal would be to have set up, have people down here realize, look, we have a Metrolink board that runs the Metrolink service. We have a low sand board that runs the Amtrak service. Maybe they could do something crazy like me <laughs> and talk with each other and figure out how to coordinate their services. You know, as Bart said, the, the, the change of the train from 8.30 to 7.30, it doesn't take cognizance of the nature of this corridor. Frankly, the last train out of here to, to the south at 10.10, is at 10.10 at night. The last train north out of San Diego is 10.05. Can you imagine that in New York? Absolutely not, it's outrage. You cannot go to a Dodger game or a concert uh, or a play and then take the train home. That is inadequate service on this corridor. So our goal is to change it. Now, we're having a hard time with North County, San Diego. Uh, they are very jealous of being independent. Uh, and they, uh, they are afraid of Los Angeles. Um, and uh, so they are, they are being difficult. We are going to try to seek getting, the, getting legislation through Sacramento that empowers this low sand board to do what I've just described. It has to have state legislation. By the way, all we are doing 
is mimicking what exists today on the Capitol Corridor up in the Bay Area. If you go on the Amtrak website, they have on-time performance by line. If you pull that data, many of the East Coast lines run at 85, 90% on time. The further west you get, the lower the average on time percent is. Isn't that funny? There's no Amtrak board member west of the Rockies. <coughs> they all think in terms of the East Coast. There's one exception on the West Coast where they have 90% on time. Do you know what it is? Capital Bay. The Capital Corridor. So what we want to do is mimic what, we're, what they're doing. We want better service, we want better coordination. We want the subway coordinated with, with, uh, with the Amtrak trains. We want all this stuff to make sense as a system. So um, I, gotta, I have a few more minutes. I'll turn it over to Frank in just a moment. Um, I've been here three years now at the MTN. I'm pleased I'm here. We're moving the highway projects. We're moving the, uh, the rail projects. We're in the process of buying uh, buses and trains. Uh, we're, I've already talked a little bit about service. Uh, rail. Um, I do want to say that we have a couple of three uh, public-private partnerships projects that might really be cool. Uh, we're <coughs> just now doing an evaluation of the tunnel under the, under the Santa Monica Mountains, under the 405. Uh, what we want to evaluate is whether a toll facility there would be self-sufficient. Um, that, and that may be the case. That, that quarter, that's very much like the 91 SR, uh, 91 toll lines in Orange County, which, by the way, makes a lot of profit. When I was in Orange, we purchased it. So uh, I hope we're doing a whole lot of things. Uh, but let me just stop and ask you if you have any questions for me before I leave. Yeah, Alan? Yeah, Art, I was just wondering. What Alan and I go back 35 <laughs> or 40 years. A long way. Uh, I was just going to say, Art, what? What seems to be holding up the, the new car rail order? You know, the credit uh, contract option was not picked up. That's been about almost two and a half years. And we're, what happens in phase two of these rail lines if we don't uh, get an order in phase two? I'm, we're going to go back to the board tonight, next meeting, and we're recommending an award to a firm called uh, Tinky. Sure. Uh, we have a, a good offer, a very good offer. We have a good car. Uh, I'm pleased with it, at a good price. Uh, for the first time in history, first time, we got the FTA to agree to include in the evaluation methodology an assessment of domestic content, that is domestic jobs, in the evaluation of the offers. Never happened before. Uh, there is a group, however, that thinks that we should make an offer to uh, the Siemens, which is a different firm. They came in number three in the rating. The problem with, with their perspective is that the federals will not approve local preference when uh, there's, federal, there's federal money <coughs> in a contract or in a purchase. So, by the way, 90 days ago, I told the board, you may not discuss local preference. I told these, these private groups, do not discuss local preference. If you want to say car B is better, we'll say it. But if you discuss local preference, the FTA accepts from the board takes your advice, the FTA may may void the purchase. Actually, what they would do is respectfully decline to participate in the funding. <laughs> um, so we're going to go to the board in a few weeks. I believe they're going to they're going to approve the award to Kinky. One of the best things about Kinky is we've asked for four cars per month. So it's an accelerated schedule. This would be their 16th uh, car order in the U.S. and they've been on time on all of them. So uh, I feel real good about it. It's, a, it's with the options up to a million dollars. So uh, I feel good about that. Now it's going to, you know, we're going to do a better job of managing that procurement than we did with the Breda car. You probably heard Breda car didn't make some of the specs. It was too heavy. And it was too narrow. Well, holy smokes! We're supposed to pay attention to stuff. We're, you know, supposed to redo, review drawings and things like that. So Frank's going to see to whether that happens. There's a proper way to do business like getting the money you paid for. Yes, sir. What do you see as the ideal way of connecting LAX into the system, and how do you get from there to the red line, the gold line, and the valley? Um, I won't say very much because you have it on next month's agenda. We have uh, three major options, which you'll see at that time. Um, and different people will like one of the three. Um, 
I, they basically involve on a macro conceptual level. One is a bus connection, uh, which is attractive in many ways. You get better frequencies, the lower cost. The problem is it's tied up in traffic. So the airport may look at some kind of a, of a bus facility. Uh, alternatively, you could take the light rail trains into the airport. I'm not crazy about that because, you know, you're coming from the north, maybe someday from West Hollywood, going down to Long Beach or something, and every train is going to take a nice excursion into the airport. Uh, moreover, even on a six or eight minute headway, uh, typically at people movers in airports, people expect to see a train every two minutes or something like that, right? Um, so that would be an operationally expensive and, and probably discourage ridership on the main line. Alternatively, some kind of a people mover like you would see around the country that would interface with the light rail line at some location. We, we, we're, we'll be discussing Century in Aviation and maybe someplace over like Sapporo in 98. All be terms. So I don't know what the answer is yet. I know the mayor wants to do it. I know the airport wants to do it. Uh, the Secretary of Transportation wants to do it. So you know, we're going to be working on it. Yes, sir. Is there any possibility that there could be heavy rail connections between airports, for example? Uh, I understand that from uh, North Hollywood to Burbank Airport, it's only two miles. That shouldn't be a problem. But then again, on the Purple Line end, when you reach Santa Monica, why not curve it down Lincoln Boulevard, go south and elevate it to the airport? Well, the current plan is to get it to to the VA hospital. Um, and for good or for ill, we have Measure R. Some people like it, some don't. Uh, some people think there's too much rail in there, but it's voter approved. And we're going to do the Measure R program. Uh, life goes on for a long time. You know, you know when the first what was your subway study was? You know when it was? 24. Back in 24. I think it was actually 10. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. You know, Mark says 20, 24, maybe it was. I, I have it in my head. A long time ago. So, you know, we're not going to, the subways, if we, can, if we can get the subway to the VA hospital in the next 15 years, that will be a major accomplishment. Yes, sir. Um, many great things. I remember last year you were talking about more trains more often, and you, you obviously have a feather in your cap having a train to SC for a commencement this, uh, this May. Um, I'm wondering about the TAP situation with regard to the Metrolink and Easy Pass and bike users. Metrolink is committed to making their, their, their materials TAP compatible. Um, there's, I'm not sure, they're aiming for June. Um, what's, what's your concern about bicycles? Okay, um, okay, so there's also Easy Pass, which I can take uh, with you offline. <coughs> the bicycle issue is that if we go to locking all of the fair dates, which we're going to do. Um, there are certain portals for uh, the red lines. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, 4th Street at Pershing Square, 1st uh, Street at uh, Civic Center, uh, I believe uh, some on Vermont, that do not have ADA accessible wide turn stops or gates, if you will. Um, so then... Uh, Let me take a look. I'm, I'm running out of time. Right. You know, it's a good question. I haven't. I. I it, it, the stations have to be accessible. Right. Uh, to even as severe disabilities. Uh, so let's talk about. Uh, I don't. So I'll, I'll I'll take it with you. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, just two couple of ideas. Uh, there there have been plans to you know concerning the uh, the statement about the um uh, and Amtrak and so forth. There have been plans for the run through tracks across south from the. Uh, Station here across the freeway for a while. I think yeah, um, Caltrans has planned this grow up, and uh, that would. I'm just wondering that would help I serve. We should do uh, that. You know, uh, San Diego to San Luis Obispo without having to back up and face forward one minute, face backward the other. I agree. I the geometry is tight, but you're right. Uh, what's what's the progress on that? I don't. Know. Well, we're, right now we're just studying the station. We're working with the high speed authority. Working with Metrolink, we agree. We think all the trains should be able to pass through over the freeway and get over to the line track. Yeah. All right. Okay. And then the other thing too is, um, as you mentioned, the different restaurants that might open up and so forth. Uh, I've heard uh, people have told me that when the um, 
addition here to the station was first planned, there was uh, going to be a balcony, a restaurant on the balcony of that uh, <coughs> a dome shaped area that never got opened up. And I don't know if it was just an accessible space for the public or actually a restaurant or uh, anything, nothing planned for that. Right? I have no idea. Okay. I've never heard the restaurant thing. Um, I don't know if there's enough room there for a restaurant. I don't think so necessarily either. I just wondered about it would be accessible. <clears throat> There's a balcony there that you can't get to. Yeah, right? I don't think. We are talking to, um, to, to when Craig gets a bakery and they want to be able to take baked goods to the Eastern Portal, and the hot dog guy wants to have a hot dog stand on the Eastern too. So, so I got to go. My train's coming. We <laughs> actually <laughs> checked. It's on time. This is Amtrak. It never runs this train on time. <laughs> One night it's on time. Our comes. So, so you, what last to question. Uh, just Quick. a brief. Um, the West Santa Ana branch is that a low priority, very low priority, middle it's priority? In the third decade. The uh, are you involved with the Orange Line Authority? Just I went to a couple meetings. Um, they um, they seem to be preoccupied with mandating the solution before they've defined find the problem. <laughs> uh, that is, they want high-speed maglev. I'm sorry, low-speed maglev. Uh, <laughs> one, one member does, and he's just... Well, so does. what they need to have is pragmatic discussion. There is some money available in the third decade, like $250 million, but I think they're talking like a $30 billion project. And we don't have the whole it's major... the guy at Cerritos Auto Square. He's <laughs> the, the chairman of... We would the, have to cancel every round project and half the highway projects in the county. Could you please Sorry. join us in giving a hand? Thank you. Thank you. Now, with, with our hybrid meeting, uh, Art kept alluding that he was going to introduce you to Frank Alejandro. Well, I guess I have to admit his bio because I've been meaning to have lunch with Frank for like a month now, and some of the people like Arnold probably could give the stand up and give the bio, but I know that Frank has was met Art here at Metro at some point in time, is that correct? <coughs> um, and then Frank went to Minnesota to do the Hiawatha light rail with Art and was successful. And then Frank didn't go to Orange County to work with Art, but he went to San Francisco to work with Muni. And then from there, Art, we have these little things at, at Metro. There was, I, I look at these emails and I think Frank might have seen one or two. Two or three years ago, we opened up a while back a, a Metrolink station in Sun Valley. And then we had this rapid bus service. And just because of the misfortune of the Metrolink station not being close to a Metro rapid bus stop, it was ineligible for a bus stop. Now, anybody that knows the 94 route, the 94 route is this local route that goes from downtown LA, used to go out to Silmar. But it got truncated in Sun Valley, one mile north of the train station. Well, the folks who ran the rapid program decided that because a bus went by the Sun Valley train station, that bus was good enough even though it takes roughly an hour to an hour and a half to take that bus from the train station north to Silmar, which is a six minute trip by train. About a month ago, we actually proved it, and that's when nuclear war hit. Um, the planner would one time the planner wrote me an email and called me on the phone and said, well, you know, you're threatening me. I'm going to tell my supervisor about this. And lo and behold, um, that was a good excuse for the fact that you'd have a half of a mile between Sunland Boulevard and the Metrolink station and seven-tenths of a mile between the Metrolink station and Tuxford. Well, but, so the idea was that when my train broke down there conveniently about a month ago, happened was seven of us, nine of us got off the train, hot blazing sun. It was one of those days where it wasn't pouring rain, blazing sun, and we walked across the tracks to the bus stop for the 94. We took it that whole seven tenths of a mile because the rapid buses kept passing us by empty. And we know that that particular planner likes to keep empty buses on time because it interferes with the schedule to have passengers. So, I mean, this is the way it works. Not Frank's here, he wouldn't probably with me, we'd like to actually have the buses stopping and have passengers. But at that point, the, the issue was that we got on that bus, 
And we waited about 10 minutes, but the rapid bus had passed us by. They could have gotten us to Silmar. Then we, we went that seven tenths of a mile. We didn't want to walk in the dirt. We got off at Tuxford, and we waited a whole 30 minutes. You know, we have that neat system where you put in pound whatever, and it tells us accurately that your bus is going to be there in 30 minutes in the boiling sun, the particular corner. And it finally got there. And then it happened to be at a school tripper time. So every time it hit a stop, the bus was carrying, when we got on it, we didn't have passengers at the next stop. All of a sudden, it went from 40 people to 70 people. And we just inched, even though it was a rapid bus, we inched along. And instead of getting to, um, to uh, Silmar at, at 2.20, I got there at 4.20, believe it or not. So I wrote an email to some of my colleagues at Metrolink. And somehow it got over to the CEO at Metrolink. You, know, you never know how those things happen, you don't like carbons. And next thing you know, it was communication with Art. And Monday morning, Art took that communication. I guess something happened, because there was a staff meeting that Monday morning. And it was indicated to certain staff members that they might consider regional connectivity. Tuesday, I got a email back that says, we've thought about it. And due to regional connectivity, we're putting your bus stop in tomorrow. So Wednesday, I'm on the Metrolink train. And in fact, the Cal State Northridge students were there. And we all looked out the window. And there was our bus stop. But it only took two hours and two hours of time where I didn't get my work done to do it. But anyways, so as Art has known Frank for a long time, Frank, from my belief, is he's part of the school of let's fix things and do it right. We're here to move passengers, not to move buses empty on time. So that's my brief introduction by way of a strange story. But with that, take it from here. All right. Interesting story on that. That email came down to me and I called our scheduling director and I said, you know, first I, I sent out an email saying, you know, why can't we do this? And the response was, well, it might cost a lot of money and I don't see why we need to go in there because the trains don't run out often, etc., etc. So I said, give me a call. So I got him on the phone and I said, I still don't understand why we can't do that. Uh, so I said, let's make the change. Let me know if it's going to cost a million dollars or whatever, but if it's not costing some exorbitant price, I want to see it happen. So within an hour, they brought me a notice saying, hey, look, we're, we're changing it. And I said, okay, good. So that's the, the story behind it. <laughs> but anyway, just a little bit about myself. Uh, so I was born in uh, Boyle Heights, East LA. Um, started in the agency with the RTD days back in 1978 as a bus operator. I was an operator for six years. Um, let's see, I worked out of, uh, just like Park, the first division I worked out of was a Cypress Park Division 3. <coughs> and then I was in Division 1 and Division 9, and then I became a Division Dispatcher and did that for four years, a bus instructor for about four years. And then in 1991, I transferred <coughs> to the Blue Line. The Blue Line has been in operation for about a year, so I went over there as a frontline supervisor and worked my way up as a senior supervisor at the Rail Control Center and then uh, a manager, assistant manager of the Blue Line Division. My last position here, uh, and I was here for 22 years, I left Metro in, in 2000. And I left as the, uh, the manager of the Rail Operating <coughs> Control Center, which used to be called something different back in that day. I went to Minnesota and I followed Art and a fellow by the name of John Burke, who actually helped us start um, our rail lines here. He had a background in operations, so uh, those two guys, Art still great, and John Bird passed away a couple of years ago. Um, very close friend of mine. So uh, we went over there to Minnesota, started a light rail transit uh, mode, and it was a good experience. Um, I left there after two years and came back to California, and uh, was hired as a systems integration rail startup manager for, at that time, the company was called Washington Group International which has since changed to URS Washington Division, but we were joint venture for the Gold Line project. So I was involved with that. And then uh, <clears throat> and then after that project ended, uh, uh, we created another joint venture project uh, for the Eastside Extension. So our company 
family come back. So it was like a homecoming because I saw a lot of old friends who were still working for Metro, so it was nice to come back. Uh, did that for six years, and then I uh, followed uh, John Byrne up to San Francisco for uh, San Francisco MTA, cable car division, this is the rail division. So <clears throat> did that for two years, and then, um, and then uh, Art recruited me back. We talked a couple of times and said, I want you back, back home. So I've been here. So I got hired in January of 2011. Got hired as the service operations uh, superintendent. And initially, I was in charge of again all the rail divisions, the rail instruction department. Um, and then I assumed the acting role as an executive officer of operations slash administration. So I, I, I got my feet wet really, really quickly in budget. <laughs> And then, uh, just uh, this is my third week, I've uh, been appointed as the Chief Operations Officer for Metro. So, <clears throat> very, very challenging position. Uh, right now, I have a lot of things on my plate. One of the, one of the things that has uh, been assigned to me, that actually I volunteered for, because uh, I saw some issues I was having, was to get this Expo Phase 1 started. Uh, <clears throat> so, as Art mentioned, there's, there's been quite a few challenges. Uh, we got over <coughs> one hump, which is to start the full free revenue service, but unfortunately we had a little problem uh, yesterday <laughs> with the Blue Line and the Expo, so we didn't start off as, as well as we would have liked to. But uh, we are going to open up the line at the end of the month, uh, and uh, it's going to be a real nice line. Uh, we're, we're, we're geared up to see how we could. This is all new to us. Uh, we have two lines merging with each other, and we have a very tight turnaround at 7th and Metro. So uh, on paper, it looks good, but this is the time where we're trying to exercise and, and tweak things so that we open up successfully on time and our customers like uh, <coughs> the service we're providing. My initial focus uh, is uh, to look at the form syndicators, the services <coughs> we're providing, and making sure that we're fully exceeding all. Uh, so it is a challenge with all the uh, service that we put out there. We do have some issues with deferred maintenance on bus and rail, so we're trying to address that. So I'm a doer. I like to do things. I like to, to accomplish things. So um, I guess uh, kind of the same way me and Art. We both, it, it's really good to, to work for somebody that can talk operations. And Art is a great leader. And he knows the business well. I've worked for other CEOs and other people that I have reported to that don't know the business as well as our folks. So when we talk, we, we just talk the same thing. So uh, anyway, I'm getting my feet wet. I'm glad you saved all those questions about the future projects, about we're disconnecting and that, because I'm still trying to get a grasp on that. Um, so that's me. I'm here. Uh, to, I, I think this is a great group. We, we need all the support that we need from everybody to to keep going with all these great projects. So if you have any questions, make them easy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So um, since you're dealing with operations, there are a couple of things that come to mind. First off, um, we were all very excited that when Metro announced the more trains more often initiative, uh, looking at increasing service frequency in the evening hours. And in addition, we've noticed that Metro has tweaked somewhat how it's applying the load factor concept. So now it, it's it's explicitly clear that the 1.3 load factor is the maximum that uh, Metro wants to see on a line, and not just an arbitrary standard applied to all lines and all places. So these are these are positive changes, improvements that we're seeing. Um, I'm wondering, in terms of uh, going forward, uh, what do you see? Metro doing to uh, increase service frequency on some of the lines that have potential to attract choice ridership. And related to that, when the rapid system was first rolled out, during peak hours, they didn't have timetables for those periods. They, they had headwinds. So it would say between uh, 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., every five to six minutes. So Metro was doing headway management. One of the great things that ART has instituted is uh, a level of discipline to adhere to schedule, as he said earlier. 
to what extent is Metro thinking about uh, instituting headway management for the peak periods? So that's the same question. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, but let, let's stick with rail. What we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to plan to eventually get to a 24 7 operation. So we're looking at what that's going to cost and how we have to change our maintenance practices, everything that we do to, to make that happen. I don't know how soon that's going to happen. Uh, as far as the, the, the headways on, there's a long history with uh, with how we, I think, initially started the rapid bus program, where I think, from what I recall, was that we were going to manage the system and, and just look at the buses, kind of like rail, but kind of space them out so that we maintain some type of headway and then we would fill in gaps, et cetera, et cetera. And then it kind of changed to a more of a time point, uh, you know, where we, we, so here's where the buses are at, our commitment to our customers. So, um, you know, we're going to look at everything. Again, we, we want to try and provide the best service for our customers. So I, I can't really answer that too much other than if you guys can give us input, Thomas, uh, we're all ears. You so called me on the, the Metrolink problem. You said, I said, well, I can't make the change. What is the issue? So, so tying it back, where it, the, the question that I asked about the service level frequency is tied to the headways. Because if you, what happened was when the frequency was cut back during budget cutbacks, that's when Metro shifted to having a, a, a full timetable rather than headway management for peak service. So to the extent that we're looking at going uh, to restore service and or to strategically add service in, 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 on routes that have potential for increased ridership. Is there a possibility of looking at headway management to save costs for Metro? Uh, just just a thought, and I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. No, what we're trying to, to run as, efficient, as efficiently as we can. So, um, you know, we look at the cost and the ridership and connections and all that. So, so sometimes it's a balance between being the most efficient, but yet not really attaining the goals you really want to achieve. So it's not an easy task. That's my response. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's the third week on the job. That's the best I can give you. We look forward to talking Okay. I, I am friendly with you uh, attending, uh, last week was a meeting down here in the uh, one of the uh, Green Line extension to LAX uh, public input meetings. That's what we'd like to see. And uh, there was a lot of interesting discussion. You know, I had my ideas, other people had their, uh, the airport people were there and so forth. But at, while they're doing the presentation, I don't, not too close to the end, but near the beginning of it, there's a chart that goes up on the screen. And by the way, we right now have something like 27% of the funds identified. Measure R. Meanwhile, this big, big gap of being able to put it through to start anything. Uh, what's the progress on, you know, like identifying more funds? If that's the, the right question to ask. I really, have an idea. I, I can't comment on that. I really haven't been involved with too much with the uh, future projects. In fact, I was supposed to get briefed this week, so I could be uh, a little bit better prepared for any questions about these. Okay. Right now, I'm putting out all the fires that we have on a day-to-day -day basis, and there's some big issues that we, we're trying to address related to the service that we provide right now. Right. So, okay. Uh, if you want to write down that question, we'll be glad to give you a response. Okay. I just, you know, because it was, it was very, it was very enthusiastic uh, talk, and then all of a sudden it became a little disappointing to see this chart up there. Yeah. And you know, I want to go nowhere, but I don't have no money, right? Okay, I guess that was it. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, Fred. Um, I appreciate all the projects uh, you're mentioning for rail and buses, but I'm, I'm a corporate commuter, and I've been sitting in traffic for way too long, so I want to know if there's any projects out there that will you know, actually find a way to carpool and move more people along, like you know, any projects for carpooling and improvement to find a smarter way to commute. Should have said all these questions for art. <laughs> I I can't answer that either. I really don't know. Uh, I can answer that. Uh, I know that we have an ongoing uh, project and some people assigned to, to get uh, more ridership. Okay, we have the people that depend.
depend on our system, but for choice riders, I know there's a, a program we're trying to generate more ridership on. Could I answer his question? Yeah. Okay. So uh, there is a project called the Express Lanes Project for the uh, Harbor Freeway and the San Bernardino Freeway, the 10 and the 110, uh, which is going to convert the existing carpool lanes to toll lanes. Um, it's going to widen the lanes uh, so there's only one lane on each side on the 10th freeway, so now there'll be two. There'll also continue to be two lanes on each side on the 110 freeway. Now, uh, with respect to carpoolers, the uh, project uh, will allow carpoolers to use the lanes without charge if they install a transponder. However, um, if there is legislation that's been introduced that would allow <coughs> carpoolers who don't have transponders to continue to use the lanes as well. So that's something that affects carpoolers that's been worked on right now. Um, in terms of new carpool lanes, there is work being done on the I-5 freeway um, to extend carpool lanes on the I-5 in the San Fernando Valley. I, mean, I appreciate that's a novel way to generate revenue for Metro, but it doesn't get people off the road and you know, more people getting into carpools versus, so we're still gonna get more and more people on the expressway and it's gonna get worse. So if you'd like to find out more, you put your email down on our uh, email list and on our weekly newsletters, we had some new data yesterday, so we'd be happy to look more. It's the same as the 91 freeway, if you're familiar with that, but it's fast track. Let me throw in an answer also to that. Um, a lot of the initiatives that we are working on and pushing are moving to that and working with Art and with um, Frank. The idea is that certain things that were untouchable, like integrating the Metrolink trains with the Losan trains, up to the last couple of years they've been untouchable. You can't get anything to work together. Well, now Art, well, as you notice, he's fairly blunt. And he's pushing to get these things. He's brought Frank in to be the butt kicker. That's true. So there's a lot of issues where it's working. Right. <laughs> and, and in working with some of our initiatives. Still afraid of me. <laughs> hey, that's cool. Um, and working with some of the initiatives that we're looking at, like for example, Ventura Boulevard theoretically should have enough service so you could have something that's attractive to choice riders. If you're attempting to get to Ventura Boulevard in the San Fernando Valley, you have to take an east-west bus perhaps the north-south bus, maybe once an hour, to a east-west bus on Ventura Boulevard. Three buses, if you miss it, you're an hour late. For well, some of the initiatives that we're going to be working on in the next year or so with the Urban Planning Department is Cal State Northridge. We're going to provide some studies looking at some of the work data, the revenue data, and the and all. And I would bet in Los Angeles County, the actual the numbers are in LA County, 7% of the people take transit to work. In the city of Los Angeles, 11% of the people take transit. And I would bet, unless you think I'm different, I'd bet about 2% or 3% take transit to Encino because it's so encumbered in terms of the poor way that the routing is done. I mean, even if it's uh, a series of U-shaped routes, so at least you had 15 minute service, say on Balboa, if you took a U down Ventura Boulevard to Van Nuys or something and moved north again with another 15 minute pair, at least if you had something going east and west, even the orange line, you'd always be able to get to your job. And if there's an analysis with metrics and cost-driven factors, then the goal is to increase the transit share to 10 or 15 percent. That might be the way it is, but we're working on initiatives and working with Metro to show those ideas because a lot of times you don't want to risk the money, but if you're only having like 2 to 3 percent ridership in that area, which is my, my guess, well, there's room for improvement. So there's there's initiatives. You, you make good points. We finally have people that are receptive to the concepts of moving people to their jobs and moving them in a, in a way that's actually useful. So back to you, Greg. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, I was wondering if uh, one of the projects, you, one of the fires you may have had to uh, help extinguish was the junction of the blue line and the expo line and the automatic my question is, what was the final solution to that, and was that something that could have been implemented six months ago and made that whole uh, thing work? And, 
and uh, uh, saved a lot of headaches for yeah. quite a number of people. There, there were there, there were several problems with that area of systems, whatever. And one of the one of the problems was that um, you know there always seems to be an interface problem, the communication between the train and the waveside system. Uh, so. We had a frequency problem. We had two frequencies fighting with each other and interfered. One was the, the, the technical <coughs> frequency and the cap signal frequency. Okay. So <clears throat> one of the solutions that they thought they could do was some software change that would separate them so that they wouldn't interfere. Uh, when they did that, um, that, that worked for a while, but then we lost uh, the, the detection of the trains. So we, we lost about a month in, in and that was Expo's call, okay? because uh, one of the, another suggestion was to put traffic loops in the embedded like a, you know, like mm -hmm. to call the traffic signal for automobiles, yeah. and that would have given a, a true, you know, read from the train car. So they decided not to do that. They went with this other fix. It didn't work. So now, guess what? We're creating the loops. Okay. So the loops work. Um, and one of the problems we had was we had a couple of issues. One is that the train is transitioning from a street run operation, which is it's not bringing anything to the rails. Okay? And the LADOT signal phasing was set on a certain speed that the train would travel from here to here at a certain speed and be able to get through an intersection so that the timing of the traffic signal would, would, would change based upon that operating speed. Well, because the system was getting off because of the lack of communication with the system to the train, uh, the trains were blocking intersections and the signal phasing was timing out. So we have trains blocking intersections. So we so there were several problems. One with the ATP system itself communicating from the train, uh, the wayside I should say, to the train and then also the transition points um, in all the areas that the trains were going to enter this junction the dropout or the loss of cap signal and the stopping of the trains created a lot of problems. So right now where we're at, they're installing the loops, it's working, they got a couple more locations. Um, so that seems to be almost completed. Uh, we're still going to work with LADOT to kind of tweak the signal <coughs> phasing based upon the, the operating speeds that we have now. Um, we've met with CPUC on that issue and other issues, and we really brokered a lot with them to try and get things going. So we are going to open up at the end of the month. Uh, we still have some remaining things to be done, but uh, it's been very interesting. Like any project, Arm uh, was uh, on the project with us on the east side. So there's always issues with projects, but this was kind of unique because the problems that we're having with this junction affected the blue line. Had a really, the customers on the blue line have really taken a hit out of this had to uh, stop running trains uh, to bus bridge and let the contractor get in there and do their initial construction work, hoping that they would be through within X amount of time. And then all these problems kept happening, so that we had to keep getting more time for them, which, which impacted our blue line customers. So I think we're in good shape now. Uh, all the remaining work is going to be done during the wee hours of the night, so we don't disrupt the blue line. And again, this week until the opening day, we're going to fully exercise the schedule, tweak it, and hopefully make sure that you know, we open up with a nice, safe, and efficient system. It's been interesting. Yeah. Okay. Justin. Who's next? Adding to that question, uh, I'm thinking of the Muni Metro Market Street subway, and I know they have very high frequency of train service through there, and they had a lot of trouble with their train signaling system when they put that in. Are there any specific signaling or crew management practices from those to be applied to the common stretch of Blue and Expo stretch north of Washington to get a similar reliability? <laughs> Muni was a good, ex uh, good experience. I was just talking about that uh, a few minutes ago. Um, the train control systems are quite different. You know, they use an axle counter to detect you know, trains ahead. And, and they got two, they've got actually two train control systems linked up to each other. They have the old system with the new system. And sometimes there's problems with one or the other. So they haven't they haven't cut 
reduce the old system and just put the new system in. Because of people that are familiar with the safety systems like crank control and ventilation, you know, you have you have a you have a primary system, then you have a backup to that system so it doesn't fail, and then you have something else usually. So I guess what I want to say is that meeting was a good experience. I'm using that to head off so we don't land up like me. Uh, what I'm talking about is the first meetings. We made some decisions, not me, <laughs> and not our, but certain decisions about the vehicles for Luma, uh, the light. So now we're trying to solve that so that we don't land up in a hole like me. Uh, other things that we need to do that we haven't done uh, as far as uh, signal systems on the blue line, the refurbishment of the stations, we're catching up with it. We have money to do that, we're rolling that out, but you know, it takes time to get that, that work done. So my job is to make sure that we, with all the money, with, you know, from uni they were broke, here we got a lot of money. So over there, they're, they're eager to spend the money, they don't have any money, here we got tons of money, and uh, we're not spending all the money that we have. So that's my job, is to not only take care of the day-to-day -day operation, but all these capital projects that we get going and they get them done. Yes, sir. Yeah, if my memory is correct, San Francisco has quite a few, has quite a few intersections that are not automated. And uh, it doesn't really matter now that uh, the junction is automated and it's going to work, but why did it have to be automated in the first place? Do you know the story behind that? Yeah, I, I know a little bit about it. Uh, Muni, you know, if you talk about the West Portal, and those of you who are familiar with that, that's where I think three different lines merge into the tunnel. And that's a very slow system that's done by actually a four-way stop, and there is a signal for the train, but it's, it's very cumbersome. You have an op, uh, a supervisor out there saying, okay, you're first, go on ahead, and so on and so forth. Um, the goal that we were trying to achieve is that the blue line has always been a pretty fast line. Uh, I went to New Jersey and I thought I was on the trolley. So <coughs> historically speaking, the blue line is a very fast line wherever it's operating in. So it's uh, <coughs> mid-corridor where you have getting crossings or the street run operations, 35 miles per hour. <coughs> so you have a train that's going to go around the curve <coughs> on the blue line. It used to be 5 miles per hour. With the new junction and the track, it's, it's not going to go for 10 miles per hour. You got a straight through move by export, it's going to be 25 miles per hour. So, so to keep that system going and to prevent any trains, you know, like a, uh, I hate to say, but Metrolink, you know, where you have a block signaling system which you're relying totally on the operator to observe and obey the signal, we felt that we needed to put a positive train control system in the junction. So that's why it's there. So it's a good thing to have, only that. You know, there's a lot of systems and interfaces, so we need to deal with that. Okay. Yes, um, I go to Cal State North Region. One of the things that I'm always dealing with is that the 240 stops running at 1204. Now, the library closes at 11 school year, but during finals, it closes at 2. Oh. So I have a choice uh, during finals. Either I crash at my friend's house, I stop studying earlier, and go home, or, you know, I figure out some way to get a ride home. Um, is there any, and I, and I remember when I was much younger, the 240 used to run almost 24 hours. I remember picking it up at Universal Studios at 3 in the morning, you know. So is there any way we could get the 240 service restored or augmented and, you know, so it's, it's much more viable for CSUN students to take it? On the operations on the first day, and I assume you said you're involved with that. Do you have any schedule yet? Because I've been asked this myself of, some, of the first train out, either either location. On the expo line? On the expo line, yeah. Uh, well, we've got some draft schedules. Uh, we're looking at an operation starting at 5 a.m. approximately to 1 in the morning. So that's what we're into right now. We're just testing a, a draft schedule and seeing how we can tweak it. Um, we have to do some unique things for the expo. Um, we have to store some trains outside of the yard 
so that we could start service on the expo per schedule without having to bring them all the way to Long Beach into the service area. So I don't know what the actual running times are going to be or revenue service, I should say. We're still going to tweak that, but approximately 5 a.m. to 1 a.m., that's the uh, revenue hours. Because I was on the first gold line, that's all. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is there any equipment stored in the tunnel out at, at near USC? Yeah. It, yeah. Okay. We have some trains stored there as an alternate uh, backup location for storage. We're going to use seven the metro. So do they have gates or that they close uh, the tunnel? Uh, no, well, no, actually we've got a guard out there. Yeah. Um, just so I can mention those that go to our Transit Coalition Discussion Board, the, the supervisor's <coughs> summary schedule that's currently being operated uh, is posted up there. It's on one of the websites. So whatever's working on now, it does show that the four trains that did head out of uh, USC in both directions that are sweeper trains that, or I forget what time, four something in the morning, four sweeper trains that go at a slow pace to make sure that the route is clear and they go into revenue <coughs> service. So you can get that through scrolling through our discussion board of, know for a fact I've seen it up there so you can get an idea of when the schedules are but it's like everything else is they discover how the trains operate in with real people it's like fine-tuning a ballet having both of these rail lines coming in and going out and everything has to stay every 180 seconds um, if there's one kind of goof up or another that messes everything up the ballet doesn't work so you've got how many people running the trains, 20, 30, 40, 60, 80, 100 people running the trains. Everybody has to learn exactly what the next move is in the ballet, and the whole team has to come together because that's the uniqueness of running this particular line is the ballet has to be perfect, and there's no room for error once it rolls. Yeah, we went from 60 blue line operators to <coughs> close to 100 operators to support the Expo Star. And because we were going to have a are for Expo until I think 2015, um, there was going to be a siding track adjacent to the Washington Station on the Blue Line, which we were going to store all the Expo trains and have a bundle of the temporary for the operators to get their assignments and get their trains. Well, that got taken away. So now we needed to store the train someplace, and uh, unfortunately we had a little, not a little, but we had an incident on the Blue Line where a dog bone, which is a, an attachment on the overhead camera system, it broke and it, it broke in the wrong place. And we had all our train cars hostage in the blue line yard. They couldn't get out because the wire was down and we lost power. So, in the aftermath of that, we, we said, Look, at, we're going to put some cars stored someplace out there as a backup, not only to start the expo line, but in the event that we have something like that happening, at least we have some. And it's been hard, I mean, you know, without having a storage yard, trying to figure out how we're going to maintain the vehicles that are stored on the main line, how we're going to do, we're talking about the train operators. Um, although we had 60 blue line operators, this new junction was all new. Thing. So they had to be on uh, The controllers at the, the rail operations control center had to run a new system. And we brought a lot of new supervisors. So everybody's still learning the system. Yes. What about some of the right of way on the non-revenue connector track to be, you know, between the curve around uh, USC and the, uh, the old uh, Enco Junction between those? Is anything planned for that? Or mm -hmm. It's just MTA property right now. Yeah. <coughs> and we looked at all the other locations to try and store things out. But, <coughs> so we're going to try this, see how it works out, and then we'll make changes. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, in the past with the goal line, we've had the advanced uh, advocates type of uh, trips. Is that going to happen on this one? Mm -hmm. I need that question. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, rail advocate mm -hmm. groups, rail fans, whatever, have had an advanced trip where they rode, you know, a week or two weeks before they opened the revenue service. Oh, okay. Well, if you want a tour, just send me an email and we are having tours for certain groups. So uh, 
Same legislation introduced that would enable Metro to install three position bike racks on buses. And Metro has money set aside, the board has already said they want to do this, but we need legislation to actually make sure that Metro is in the um, But even with three position bike racks, we'll still have full bike racks on certain lines like Venice and Wall Street. Um, I've been a representative at the Metro Bicycle Roundtable meetings. I don't know if you're familiar with that since you just recently come on board in terms of taking the operation. It's been going on for about two years. Um, one of the things that we've been discussing and Metro has been looking at but hasn't taken action on is with respect to allowing bikes on board buses when there is space Right now, Metro doesn't really have an explicit policy. They have informal guidance to operators that on the orange line uh, and for the last bus that operates to basically let bikes on board um, if there's space available. And at other times, they can also let bikes on board if space available, but it's not clear. And so operators, I'm a cyclist. Operators don't know whether they can or can't do it. Some have been told by their supervisors that they can do it, but if they do it, that they will personally be held liable if something goes wrong. Others have been told to strip out they can't do it. So there's a lack of consistency in terms of how this is being handled. Obviously, you don't want bikes on board buses when they're full. But to the extent that especially late at night when service is infrequent, um, when there's space available. Is there any possibility that Metro Operations could give some guidance to its operators that it's okay to allow bikes on board buses? So I think it involved when I was on rail only with the removal of the seats and, and getting that going. And and tell you, thanks for getting it done on yeah. the whole line. I, I, I saw that recently. Yeah, and I, I can tell you that I was all for it. We allow the bikes and the buses or not, I think there needs to be some clarity on that. So I'll look into that and I'll get back to you to this group. <coughs> uh, I, I heard that you know we can't do it for whatever reasons, but I haven't got in for that. So let me let me get some clarity. When is your next meeting? Um, the Metro Bicycle Roundtable actually has not met um, this year. It's it's been kind of in limbo as staff has been transitioning uh, at operations. So she has an answer. Yes. Yeah, I don't want to give you an absolute, but uh, I think after Expo that we will have a meeting. That's one that will answer that question. And I wanted to address the issue of the bikes on the on the bus. Yeah. I was on the blue bus. Imagine that, down in Culver City. And I happened to be talking to the operator there, and they allowed our bikes on the back of their buses at night when they notice, you know, people are coming home late from work, and they're asking, they're, and, the, and the rack's full. And I guess what they're planning on doing is taking out some seats in the way back. That so back. Was the wall. The long beach every three years. Long Beach does LA's commuter express buses now do several others do as well. Uh, I'll fill in also. Let, let me fill out. in one piece too on that. Yeah. Um, recently is uh, Sunday I actually spoke to um, some members of the state assembly and the assembly members uh, there's one assembly member that blocked the 
bike racks being put on the buses, the last minute to the shock of some people, and our legislative director went around after he, we were blindsided, the whole bike world was blindsided by this. So um, we've been working on some advocacy issues in terms of writing some letters if we can get all 500 letters from the bike world and the transit world asking, because it's the last mile. A lot of people live in areas that it isn't easy to walk and you get off your bike and get on the bus or you get off the bus and get on your bike and get the rest of the way home. So, uh, gee, in the, in the census data and all, it's all, all sorts of data showing that people in lots of communities need that to get home. And the transit works for them. Obviously, after 8 o'clock at night, a lot of buses aren't full. They're probably, you know, when working as a team, maybe those accommodations at some point then start to come forth. But in terms of the transit and the bike advocate world, we do need to flex our muscles with the legislature because one of the, uh, wasn't the assembly member itself, but the staff person sort of telling me, well, Metro hadn't signed its contract with the union and the bus drivers work real hard and there were all these concerns and we ought to negotiate a deal whether we should have one or two or three bikes. And it's like, excuse me, um, the contract was signed a while back. The operators are there to move people, not to negotiate on how many should be allowed on the bikes, on the buses. And last Thursday when the mayor heard about this, actually this farm of ours brought it to the attention of the mayor, the mayor went to be kind, apoplectic, he said, not care. We're here to meet people. We are going to find a sponsor for this. And I met with government affairs <coughs> recently as yesterday and working on well, reapproaching some of the parties in Sacramento to re-sponsor the bill and work with Metro to bring this to fruition. And you know, whatever way as this group and some of the multiple groups can work with you to facilitate it, uh, we're all, you know, as a, also a Boyle Heights guy, I can tell you that people need get that last step of the bikes work and we're solving problems throughout the universe. So we appreciate that. Any more Most questions? Are bikes, are you free to find out what the issues are? <coughs> of course, there's probably some safety issues. I don't know if there's the whole lot or not, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll get back to you. Yes? I, I do know that there is a legislative issue in terms of the outside bikes being loaded on the front, the third, the third size, I know that's a, something that has to be passed by legislation, but inside, um, as you said, it may be a safety issue, but I don't think it's a legislative issue. Well, are there any more final questions? Because Frank said his, um, you would like to join and we're going to have another 35, 40 minutes of meeting and there may be some issues to familiarize yourself with. So. Frank's got cards here that are up by my desk, so if you'd like to prank cards.